Um, I just recently watched uh, one of your videos of you debating with transgendered protesters at UFT uh, free speech rally in October. And one of the uh, protesters, one of the comments one of the protesters uh, said to you, which was in particular very, very chilling, was um, why do you have the right to determine whether an individual is worthy of you using their pronouns? Um, the scary thing to me is how common this type of view is among radical left-wing uh, protesters on university campuses who feel they have the right to tell other people uh, what they can think, what words they can use, and what speakers they can or cannot listen to. Um, the even scarier part is that our government is creating legislation to back up their ideolo ideologies, uh, which is evident through Bill C-16, uh, M-103, and Bill 89. Um, so my question is, what do you think um, the end game is in all of this? Because it seems every year... We're, we're, we're in the process of finding that out. You know, and... Oh, sorry, I, I'm sorry. Oh, I didn't, no, no, okay. Are you, yeah. okay. Yeah. We're in the process of finding that out. Um, I don't... I mean, I think the end game that underlies all of that, in my estimation, is best summed up by Jacques Derrida's Christian, her, her criticism of Western civilization. It's phallogocentric. Now, we've already talked about what the logos means, right? And so, and, and so for, for Derrida, that was a sign of its utter, uh, what would you call it, utter, despic the, the utterly despicable dominant nature of Western culture. Well, that, that's what animates the postmodernists. Now, they may not know that because an ideology gets fragmented across its adherents, and then it only acts as the coherent ideology when all those adherents come together in a mob. And then you see the animating spirit. So, I, th I think that there's a battle going on that's a battle exactly at the level that Derrida described. And that's a theological battle with a philosophical, uh, with a, with a philosophical implications. And out of those philosophical implications come political implications. But it's not primarily political and it's not primarily philosophical. It's deeper than that. And the postmodernists are out, their, their criticism was designed to be fundamental. And it also emerged out of Marxism. And let's not forget that the Marxist criticism was not only fundamental, but just about resulted in the nuclear annihilation of the world. These are not trivial issues. And we're back in the same in, insane boat. And so, what do I think should be done about that? Well, I've thought about that way before any of this happened. And I think that what we should do about it is we should tell the truth because there isn't anything more powerful than that and that's the right theological answer because the spoken truth brings good into being well that's the phallogocentric idea and I've, I'm trying to revisit that to explain to people what it means and to see if they think that's a good idea I mean that's what we have to figure out is, it, is that an idea worth adhering to or not the alternative is the... See, for the postmodernists, the world is that landscape of pyramids that I described. But there's no transcendent vision that's over above that. And all of those pyramids are equally valid and it's a war of everyone against everyone. It's like, it's like the nightmare of Hobbes, Thomas Hobbes, except that it's not individuals, it's groups. And everyone's a group. You're a group. You're whatever your group is. It's like, that's death as far as I'm concerned. It's, it's, it's utterly reprehensible. And, and we better sort it out, because if we don't sort it out, we are bloody well going to pay for it. So, thank you.